Who actually are the Faceless Men? Why were they formed? Where did they originally come from? And what does that tell us about what they might actually want in A Song of Ice and Fire? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover the best in fantasy books and TV shows. A Song of Ice and Fire, The Lord of the Rings, The Witcher and much more. If that sounds good, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. This is the start of a new series of videos exploring the role of the faceless men in A Song of Ice and Fire. Or, more accurately, it's a revised and fully updated version of a series of videos I did on this subject a few years ago. The origin story that we know for the faceless men comes from the kindly man, who is one of the characters Arya meets at the House of Black and White in the books, and who seems to be overseeing her training. He recounts the tale that the first faceless man was in Old Valyria, well before the doom. He heard the prayers of the slaves in the mines beneath Valyria, heard them crying out to countless different gods for an end to their suffering, and concluded that although they all thought that they were calling out to their own god from wherever they had originally come from, actually they were all calling out to the same god, who had many names and many faces. The man then decided that he must be that god's instrument. He was there to answer their prayers, and brought the gift, as he called it, to the most miserable and desperate slave. The gift and freedom of death. He followed this up by giving the same gift of death to many other slaves who prayed for it, until one day the first faceless man heard a slave crying out not for his own death, but for the death of his master, offering everything he had. The first faceless man thought that this would be pleasing to the many-faced god, and as the slave had nothing to offer other than himself, created the first convert to the faceless men. The master was killed, and now there were two faceless men dedicated to serving the many-faced god. How long this went on for, we do not know, because the next time we hear from the Faceless Men, they have moved base a couple of thousand miles away, apparently as a fully-fledged religious society of assassins, when the city of Bravos announced itself to the world. Which, rather unhelpfully, opens up a whole new series of timeline questions, because we don't know for sure when Bravos was established. We know it is not an old city, by Asozi standards anyway. It was founded by slaves who rebelled against the yoke of the Valyrians, and its very existence was a secret for over a century, and its location a secret for three times that, or more. And at some point in this secret past, perhaps even at the beginning, the cult of the many-faced god made its way from Valyria to Bravos, and the House of Black and White was formed. But whatever the mechanism for the faceless men arriving at Bravos, whether they were part of the original founders or were later arrivals, the city is undeniably a perfect fit for them. Being founded by former slaves, like the first faceless man, it is staunchly anti-slavery. The first law of Bravos is that no man, woman or child will ever be a slave. It is also anti-Valyrian. It's a little reference side note to Aegon's invasion of Westeros that Bravos sent a fleet to help defend Westeros against the Targaryens, albeit to little effect. Keep a note of that for what might happen when Danny invades Westeros. And finally, the city has complete freedom of religion, not just tolerating different faiths, but actively allowing any and all faiths, because it was founded by people, the former slaves of any and all faiths. Once established, the House of Black and White became a temple of sorts, where people could go to die. Like with the original gift given to the slave, this is for those seeking release from their struggles in life. Aya helps an old woman to take a drink from the poisoned fountain at the centre of the house as part of her duties. I say it became a temple of sorts, because it really isn't like any other religious temple. There are no services or rituals, nobody is told what to believe, there are no rules or guidelines for life or apparently any attempt to convert people. There's just a large room that is open to all. All of which perhaps explains why this cult has not expanded, why you won't find temples of black and white elsewhere. This faith does not actually care whether you believe it is telling the truth or not, there is no proselytising. 
There are many statues of various gods in the House of Black and White, but no central focus on an altar or a mystical symbol. There is no picture or graven image of the many-faced god. What is being put across is clearly based on an understanding of the gods, but it isn't a religion in a classical sense. There is no one preaching or trying to impart any truths. In fact, the faceless men are very happy for people to carry on believing whatever gods or religion they already believe in. Instead, the impression is of a group of people who believe that they understand a deeper truth than the other religions. That whatever you might think you are worshipping, actually it's something different. And it actually doesn't matter whether you know or believe that to be true. So no image of the many-faced god, him or herself. Just images and statues of his many faces. Of course, there does need to be some sort of passing on of the torch to the next generation, and that is why we see Arya and others going through their training and apprenticeships. We tend to focus on the elements of the training most associated with being an assassin, fighting, poisons, disguises and so on, but another part does seem to be about passing on the ethos and the theological basis of the order. This theological basis appears to be that Vala Morghulis, all men must die, and Vala de Hiris, all men must serve. These aren't just cool catchphrases, they are statements of faith. The role of the faceless men is to serve the many-faced god by facilitating deaths. This makes the House of Black and White both a sort of centre for assisted suicide and home base for their role as assassins. Both are sacred functions for their god. An assassination contract is not a simple business deal for them, it is a holy sacrament. We will come back to the significance and implications of this several times over the next few videos, but for now the main point is that although the outside world thinks of them primarily a guild of assassins, they see themselves as a religious order, servants of the god of death. Of course, there is a business element to the assassination contracts, and there is little doubt that the faceless men have grown rich from their work, even though they aren't particularly ostentatious about it. Once a contract has been agreed, it is allocated to one of the assassins, which brings us to one of the most intriguing aspects of how they operate, that a contract cannot be given to a faceless man who knows the intended victim. We see this when Arya witnesses a business meeting in the House of Black and White, where they are divvying up assassination contracts. One of the faceless men says he cannot do one of them because he knows that man, so someone else takes it on instead. This has some amusing side effects, such as when Arya is first sailing to Bravos, and the crew know that she is going to join the faceless men because she has that coin from Jacken. They try endlessly to get her to remember their names, thinking, logically enough, that this would protect them from her killing them when she has finished her training. But it does also shed light on the whole becoming no one business, because the main point about this rule about not being sent to kill someone you know is presumably to prevent a situation where the assassin may have feelings about who they are sent to kill and compromise the mission. So despite the rhetoric, it seems that the faceless men are not expected to completely lose their old identities and memories. This seems to be a bit of a pattern. Jacken breaks or bends what he claims are the rules of the Order quite a lot, as we'll see in the next couple of videos. So there is more than a hint here that the absolutes that Aya is being told, like needing to completely abandon her old self, for example, are actually less absolute than they first look like. Bear that in mind when thinking about what Arya becoming a faceless man might actually look like. She would still also be Arya Stark. Anyway, we should be in no doubt that this isn't just a highly effective and highly trained assassin's guild. It is a fanatical death cult with its own motivations and agenda that thinks that it knows better about the nature of gods and magic and life and death than anyone else. So, if the Faceless Men do have beliefs and organisational aims, what are they? And how will they impact on the story? Well, let's start with something they probably don't care about as much as you might think. You will find many theories out there suggesting that they are secretly dedicated to ending slavery or opposing the Targaryens because they came from the slave mines. 
Certainly that's the case for Bravos as a whole. However, to apply it unthinkingly to the faceless men would be to fundamentally misread what they think was important about their own origin story. To the faceless men, the time in Valyria was about understanding the nature of the many-faced god and about bringing the gift of death to those who seek it. It wasn't really about the moral rightness of freeing slaves from their oppressors. In the books, Arya is constantly seeking reasons for why people need to be killed by the faceless men, her starkish moral compass always wanting there to be some justice behind an execution. But the answer from the kindly man is always the same. It's not about that, about deciding who should or shouldn't die, because all men must die. When Arya tells the kindly man that she thought the first gift of death should have been given to the slave masters, not to the slaves, the kindly man noticeably doesn't agree, or even acknowledge the idea that there was a justice issue here at stake at all. He simply asserts that the slave masters were also given the gift at a later time. Yes, the clear hint here is that the faceless men were involved in the Doom of Valyria. That's what we'll look at in our next video. And hopefully by now it should be clear that their involvement wasn't out of a sense of social justice, it was just a matter of serving their god. More on that next time. So if that, vengeance or social justice, is not what they're about, what do they want? I think that there are three levels to this, all of which are connected to the only thing they seem focused on, serving the god of death. First, they want to just carry on with their day-to-day -day offering of a service to those who want to die at the House of Black and White. This may seem like a pretty boring desire and won't have much impact on the plot, but to them it is a deeply important sacrament. Second, they want to do the assassination jobs they are hired for, because Vala de Hyris, all men must serve, and the many-faced god must get its due. This will have an impact on the plot going forward, and it definitely has behind the scenes on the plot so far. In the books it is clear that Euron hired the faceless men to kill his brother Balon Greyjoy, so that he could seize the Salt Throne, for example. But third, and I think most importantly for the plot going forward, the faceless men are facing a new challenge, one that strikes to the core of their doctrine. Because what a cult of death will fear and hate the most is not, say, Daenerys and her dragons killing thousands wherever she goes. After all, all men must die. No, what they will want to oppose most of all is a force or forces that are committed to ensuring that not all men die. That someone at death's door, like, say, the mountain, or someone who has recently died, like, say, Beric Dondarrion, or the entire army of the dead, do not die. They can be brought back. This is heresy to the faceless men, a challenge to everything they believe in. Can they really stand by and let their foundational belief be challenged in this way? I think not. And one of the things we'll be doing over the next few videos is taking a look at what they might be doing about it. But what do you think? What do you think the Faceless Men want as an organisation? Let me know in the comments below. If you want more A Song of Ice and Fire videos, please click on the playlist on the left of your screen. Or if you'd like to support this channel, the best way to do that is by clicking on the link to Patreon on the right of your screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.